Hey, uh, I just wanted to have us look through some more of the related rates problems. So if you remember in class last time, we got a little bit of a start on this. So we talked about how um, in related rates problems, actually in any of these kind of word problems where things are changing, you know, we're given rates of things, we're assuming that all of those are changing with respect to time. So embedded in w within every variable that we have, and again, we already filled out this part, embedded within each variable, uh, we would say that each of them is a function of time. So V is a function of time, the volume um, of this cone that's, um, you know, that water is leaving. The radius, again, the radius is going to get smaller and smaller as water is draining out of the tank. How is it getting smaller? Well, it's getting smaller uh, based on the amount of time. So radius would be impacted by time. It would be a function of time. And same thing with the height. The height of the water in the cone is going to be impacted by time. And so we said as we go through and we take the derivative, um, instead of just having one variable where we do the, you know, dy dx like we did in, in implicit differentiation, every variable is going to have that notation because all of them are going to be functions of t. So in, we would say not just v prime, we would say it's the derivative of v with respect to time. And again, the derivative of height with respect to time, the derivative of radius with respect to time. Um, and so we're going to have a lot of this in here, which will start to look confusing, but uh, it will be okay. Sorry, I have stuff under here. Okay, and then we also did a problem here. There weren't, it wasn't like an application like up here where we've got that cone where water is draining out. It's just saying, hey, let's say we've got some function where the variables are related in this way, that y is x squared plus 3. It's asked, it asked us to find dy dt when x was 1, and it told us that dx dt was 2 at that moment when x is 1. And so just we went through, we broke down the equation, we took the derivative, um, we wrote down, well actually we just acknowledged this up here, and so then we said when x is 1 and dx, uh, d2, dx dt is 2, then we can just substitute them in there, and that we get dy dt, which it asked us to find, was 4. Alright, so we're going to look at the next three examples, uh, and these are all going to be not just something where it's just some random equation that we don't know where it came from or or what it represents, uh, but applications of that. But before we do that, I want to just point out some things here about um, related rates that will just kind of act as a framework for as we go through these problems so that we can just make sure that we do the necessary steps to solve them. So when solving related rates, uh, we need to create a mathematical model from the written description to help us do that. Within each problem, we will um, draw a diagram if it's appropriate. Again, sometimes we might be given a diagram, sometimes it doesn't really call for a diagram, but if a diagram is appropriate, then draw a diagram. Uh, you should write down the rates and any other information that we have that are given and the one or ones that we're asked to find. So in each of these we'll have a given and a find. Um, and then next would be write the equation that relates all the variables. So in the example that we were just talking about with the cone, it was volume equals one-third pi r squared times h. Um, and so there is going to be an equation that links all the variables and that is important for us to write down. Um, we're going to take the derivative of the equation implicitly. And again, what we mean there is that every time we take the derivative of the variable, it's implicitly got a, it is a function of t. So we'll always have uh, dx dt or dh dt or dv dt, whatever that is. All right, and then the last thing, again, it's so tempting to put this, to do this earlier, but the very last thing is finally to substitute the information into that derivative that we took and solve for the desired rate, All right? Uh, this is where you're going to make your mistake, is my guess. Um, because it's very tempting to put it in earlier. And if we do that, a lot of times what we're going to find out is we just end up with zero because we've got all these constants filled in um, and it just doesn't quite work out. So make sure that you do that last. Uh, and the mnemonic that we're going to use is DREADS and that comes from uh, the D in diagram, the R in rates, the E in equation, the D is the derivative, and S is substitute. So if you're trying to remember the steps, we're just going to use DREADS. 
Okay, so let's take a look at this example here. Example two, ripples in a pond. A pebble is dropped into a calm pond causing ripples in the form of concentric circles. The radius r of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. When the radius is four feet, at what rate is the total area of the disturbed water changing? All right, you might wanna pause and just go back and read that again, because there's a lot of information in there. All right, so let's just go through with dreads then. So our first thing is draw a diagram, just so we see what this is looking like. All right, I'm sure you've all played by a pond and thrown a rock in there, and so you know that the, that would be the impact spot, and then it just keeps creating these concentric circles uh, where the water is rippling out. All right, so this would be like from above. If you were doing it from kind of the side, it would look more like that as it's going out. All right, but either way, we just want to see that we've got these concentric circles in there. All right, and again, mine is not drawn very well because it's much flatter on that side than it is over here. But anyway, pretending that that was accurately drawn, we would say that this is the radius, again, from the center to the outer ring. All right, so the radius uh, of the outer ripple all right, is increasing at a rate of one foot per second. Okay, so hopefully you feel okay with whatever you've drawn there for your diagram. All right, so then the next thing would be the R for rates, and we're just gonna write down uh, what's given and what they want us to find. All right, so we go back and read this. Uh, there's no information in that first sentence other than they just tell us what's going on. So then it says the radius R of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. All right, so the thing that's changing here is the radius. So they're telling us that dr dt is what's changing and it's changing at a constant rate of one foot per second. And when they say that, it means it doesn't matter how much time has passed. If you've just thrown the rock in or the pebble in or if it's three seconds after, uh, it's increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. All right. So then it says, when the radius is four feet, at what rate is the total area of the disturbed water changing? All right. So this part is going to be find something when something. All right. So this when is going to be at a certain time. All right. So find something at this time. All right. So the time here is uh, not necessarily time or at a certain point in time. So here it's when r is four feet. All right, and when I say a certain time, it means like a certain event here. Let's say that the radius is four feet. All right, and they're asking us to find the rate at which the area changes. At what rate is the total area um, A of the disturbed water changing? So that's what they want us to find. And that is what we would call DA DT because it's the, uh, the area is changing. All right, so DA DT. Here it was the rate that was changing. This is the area that's going to change. Okay, hopefully you're feeling all right about that. All right, so the next thing is we write the equation. All right, so we're trying to think of what equation that we would have in this case uh, that would relate the area and the radius. All right, so hopefully you're thinking that um, it would be area equals pi r squared. All right, let me pause here for just a second and bring your attention to, oops, oh my goodness, this is not going to fit in here. All right, your textbook. All right, and I'm going to specifically open to the very, very back page. So remember at the front we had that page, again it's thick, we had the one that had all the trig functions on it, and this one is all formulas from geometry, and so there's things about uh, area and um, volume, surface area, different things like that. So any formula that you would probably need would be back on this page. So if you're struggling to figure out what the relationship is between the variables, check this page out. 
all right? Okay, so back to this. Again, I'm telling you that hopefully you remember the formula for the area of a circle, but if not, that would be a good place to find it. Okay, so the next is D, so D-R-E, D, dreads, so next is D, and this is where we take the derivative. Right. And again, every single variable we're going to treat as like implicit, and so we're going to have to make sure that we put the dt underneath. So here we get dA dt equals, again, pi is just a scalar right there. So when we take the derivative of it, it's, this is not a product rule. This is just r squared with like, imagine that was a 3 in front. So when we take the derivative of this, we're going to bring that 2 down, 2 pi r. And then because we took the derivative of something, it doesn't matter what, we have to write the derivative of that variable with respect to t. All right? Again, I know it's really easy to forget these, so try not to because it's going to mess up your answer if you don't put them in. Okay, and finally, at the very last bit here, we get to substitute in. All right, so... Um, they're asking us to find dA dt, and so we don't have anything to fill in there, so we're just going to leave that as dA dt. And then we've got 2 pi, and then it says when r is 4 feet, so in place of r we're going to write 4. And then we know dr dt, that was the given, it's 1 foot per second. Alright, so then we're just going to kind of clean this up. So that's going to tell us that dA dt equals 8 pi. And then we have to put the unit that we would measure the change of area. So we go back up to the problem. Um, and this was measured in feet. And it tells us that it's increasing at feet per second. Right? Now area is not going to change at feet per second because it's a square unit. And so we would say that this would be feet squared per second. All right, that would be our answer. Okay, if you want to pause and just go back and read that again and just make sure that you're okay with that, um, that would be a good idea because these do definitely take a while to get used to. All right, example three, another one that's kind of a uh, little bit on the more normal side. The next two are going to be a little bit weirder. All right, air is being pumped into a spherical balloon at the rate of 4.5 cubic feet per minute. Find the rate of change of the radius when the radius is 2 feet. All right, so let's first start by drawing our diagram. So we've got a spherical balloon. It looks something like that. All right, and it's telling us that the radius is changing at a certain rate. So again, the, imagine this is three-dimensional, so we've got a radius in there. All right. This is where we are going to do the given and the find something when something. I think this is usually the easiest part. It says when the radius is two feet, so that is going to be when r equals two feet, or just say when r is two. All right, we could also maybe in this case, I think this one is pretty straightforward, find the rate of change of the radius. All right, so that's what they're asking us to find. So that would be dr dt. All right, this one I'm not sure is completely obvious. All right, so air is being pumped into a spherical balloon at a rate of 4.5 cubic meters per minute. Um, I like to look at the units to kind of help me figure out what this is. So what would we be measuring in cubic feet? All right, so think about that for just a second. All right, and hopefully you're saying, well, cubic feet is three dimensions, right, versus in the previous problem where we measured square feet per minute or per second. Um, that was the area. So cubic feet per minute goes with a volume. So we must be given dv dt because this is cubic feet. Right? If it was square feet per minute, then we would say, oh, that's probably something about area. But cubic feet is about volume. All right, and it tells us that it's 4.5 uh, feet cubed per minute. 
All right, so again, use those units to help figure out what they're asking you to find. All right, the equation. And again, this is a perfect time to go and look in the back of your book there. Um, but here I will tell you that volume equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. All right, so dre d comes next. That's the derivative. And again, we're going to take the derivative implicitly here. And so that means that this becomes dv dt. All right. 4 thirds pi is our scalar right here, so it's not going anywhere. We don't take the derivative of that. It's just a number. Uh, but we will bring that 3 down. So this is going to end up 3 times 4 thirds. That's just going to give us 4 pi radius squared. And again, because we took the derivative of r, we need a dr dt. Okay, finally we get to do the substitution. All right, so we'll go back to what we were told. We know that dv dt is 4.5, and so we're going to write 4.5 in here equals 4 pi. All right, so it tells us that uh, we want to find dr dt, so that's what our missing thing is that we're trying to solve for, and it tells us they want us to find it when r is 2. So now is the appropriate time to put 2 in there, and then dr dt. All right, I'm going to clean this side up. So I've got 4.5 equals 8 pi dr dt. I'm going to just divide both sides by 8 pi. So we get dr dt equals 4.5 divided by 8 pi. Shoot, I should have my calculator here. Uh, that, I'm just going to double this uh, so it ends up being... Uh, sorry, I missed something here. Oh, I see what I did. That should be a 4. So this should be 16 pi. Sorry, I just put r in instead of r squared. Um, and so that ends up being 4 times 4 pi, which gives us 16 pi. So sorry, this is actually 16 pi right here. So that it's not a decimal, I'm just going to double both numerator and denominator. So this is 9 over 32 pi. And we could write the units there. Uh, again, it was in feet per minute here. It was cubic feet per minute. So our radius is going to change in feet per minute since it's just a linear measurement. And if you want, you could divide this out. This ends up being approximately 0 0.09 feet per minute. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at example four. Now we're kind of in the big leagues here. Um, the next two problems that we're going to do are really uh, kind of anomalies in the problems that we'll normally be looking at. Um, we'll build up to problems like this after we do after we finish this packet, but um, most of them are going to be very. Um, they kind of all separate into families of certain types. Lots of ones with cones, lots of ones with circles, lots of ones with ladders sliding down a wall. Um, but this one I would say is unusual and example five is unusual. So let's take a look at this one. An airplane is flying on a flight path that will take it directly over a radar tracking station as shown in the figure. So here is our radar tracking station right here and this plane is coming over here and it's going to fly directly over top of it. Right, and fortunately they've drawn some information for us. They tell us that it's six miles above the ground right here, and that this unit from the plane diagonally down to the radar tracking station they're calling S, and that the ground distance is X. All right, so six feet here, this distance is S, this distance is X. All right, and again, here's where they say that the altitude is six miles. Um, all right, so S is decreasing at a rate of 400 miles per hour. So as we keep going over this, this is getting smaller and smaller by 400 miles per hour. Uh, when, uh, when S is 10 miles, what is the speed of the plane? All right, so if S is decreasing at a rate of 400 miles per hour, uh, when S is 10 miles, what is the speed of the plane? Okay, 
So we've got our diagram drawn, thank goodness. I'm not sure that I could come up with that based on the description here. All right, so then our R stands for rate. All right, so let's go back and read this again. It's flying over a flight path. We'll take it directly over a radar tracking station. S is decreasing at a rate of 400 miles per hour. All right, so when we see at a rate of, that is going to be our, you know, whatever, something DT is 400 miles per hour. And because it's decreasing, this is going to be negative 400. So what is it that's changing at a rate of negative 400 miles per hour? Well, it's saying S is decreasing. So this should be DS DT. All right. Um, so this is the given. And now it's asking us to find Right. So what is it asking us to find? Find what is the speed of the plane. All right. So the speed of the plane is going to be, again, if you were thinking like I would measure speed by how fast it's going this way, we don't have a variable for that, but it would be the same as its ground speed right here. So it's asking us to find the speed of the plane. All right. In other words, how fast is x changing? So find dx dt when s is 10. All right, just let that sink in for a minute. s is decreasing at a rate of 400 miles per hour. So ds dt is negative 400 miles per hour. And it's asking us for the speed of the plane against that. That's its horizontal distance. So in our picture, the only variable we have to represent that is x. So dx dt when s is 10. OK, so let's talk about something here. So first, let's write the equation that relates these. All right, so we've got s, we've got x, we've got 6. So what? equation can we say would relate those three uh, measurements? All right, and again, you can look in the back of the book to see if you can find something. Um, but hopefully you look at this and you see hmm, a right triangle and I've got information about the sides. Hopefully you start thinking Pythagorean theorem. All right, And so I would say the equation that relates these would be x squared plus 6 squared equals s squared. All right, sum of the squares of the legs equals the square of the hypotenuse. All right, so I'm just going to rewrite this as x squared plus 36 equals s squared. Now, before we go any further, uh, when we take the derivative of this, we're going to get a ds dt. Actually, let's take the derivative. Let, let's just go back because right now you might just be looking at this and saying, fine, let's just take the derivative. So let's do that. And then we'll, we'll run into a problem and then we'll go back. Uh, to fix that problem. So when I take the derivative of this, I get 2x dx dt. This is just going to give us a 0, so we're not going to write anything there. And then 2s ds dt. All right. Now, I go through and I'm looking at everything. So I know ds dt is negative 400 miles per hour. I know s is 10. I'm asked to find dx dt, so I'm not surprised I don't have anything to fill in there. But this is kind of a bummer. They don't tell me what x is. They don't ask me to find x. It's just kind of there, and I don't have any information about it. So sometimes you'll find that happen, um, and there's going to be different ways that we deal with this. In this case, we're just going to go back up to here and look at the relationship that we have here. When s is 10, um, I can use that to figure out what x is. So I'm going to pause right here and I'm going to say, hey, when s is 10, that means this side of the equation is 100. This is 36 plus x squared. I can subtract 36 and I get x squared equals 64. And so when s is 10, x is 8. So I'm going to write uh, x equals 8. All right, so when s is 10 and x is 8. All right, so they didn't tell us that, but they gave us enough information to figure that out. All right, so I'm going to go back down here now. Now I have everything I need. 
right? So now it comes time to substitute, right? So we've got two times, and in place of x, I'm gonna write the eight that I just found. I'm not gonna replace dx dt with anything because that's what I'm trying to find. I've got two. I could have just divided both sides by two. I don't know why I didn't just do that. Um, times s, which is 10, and then ds dt is negative 400. All right, so I get 16 dx dt equals, uh, let's see, 20 times 400 would be negative 2,000. Let me just make sure I've got that right. Or I'm sorry, not negative 8,000. Why did I say that? 2 times 400 is 800, and then times 10 would be 8,000, so negative 8,000. Um, okay, and then we're going to divide both sides by 16, and so we're going to end up with dx dt equals negative uh, 8,000 over 16, which is negative 500. All right. And then this, uh, it says, what we just found here again is the derivative. The derivative, if you remember when we did this, the first derivative represents velocity and the second derivative represents acceleration. The difference between velocity and speed is velocity is directional, so it tells us that it's decreasing, uh, but speed is just the absolute value of that. So it would say here uh, the velocity is negative 500 miles per hour. So the speed of the plane is 500 miles per hour. All right, again, Feel free to pause, go back, think about it again, rewatch, try it on your own again. Um, just I, they take a while to process. Okay, this is the last example we're going to do. I'm not even sure if we're going to do example six, just because um, it's a challenge. But we'll definitely do example five here. All right. So this right here. Uh, it's going to give us a lot of information that it doesn't say in the problem. So find the rate of change of the angle of elevation of the camera shown in the given figure at 10 seconds after liftoff. So if you just did that and just looked at this, uh, you might be feeling like you don't have enough information. So it says the television camera is at ground level and it's filming the liftoff. So here is the camera right here. Here's where the rocket is, it's lifting off. So the liftoff of a space shuttle that is rising vertically according to the position equation s equals 50 t squared. So all it shows us here is s, but this is actually equal to 50 t squared. All right, so whatever time has passed, we square it and multiply by 50, and that tells us the position of the rocket. s is measured in feet and t is measured in seconds. The camera is 2,000 feet from the launch pad. Right here is the angle of elevation, right here. So it's the angle that is between the ground and wherever our line of sight from the camera is up to the um, space shuttle. And then it also tells us that the angle of elevation can be measured, or the equation that we have that's going to tell us the relationship between the angle of elevation and the height of the rocket is tangent of theta is s over 2,000. Right, and hopefully that's not a shocker. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So if we have tangent of theta, it's s over adjacent, which is 2,000. Right? Okay, so our diagram right here. All right, uh, the rates. So let's see what we know. All right, so. This is one where we would look at this and we would say, I don't see where they tell us anything, really. It's saying, find the rate of change of the angle of elevation uh, of the camera shown in the figure at 10 seconds after liftoff. So I can say, 
maybe I could say I could find something when something. All right, so here I would say that's when t is 10. 10 seconds, that's when we're supposed to find something. It's the rate of change of the angle of elevation. So angle of elevation is theta. So that would be d theta dt. But what the heck are we trying to, or what the heck are we given? All right, so the only other variable in here is s, all right? Um, but they don't give us any information about that. But I could say right here, I do know that s is 50 t squared. So if s is 50 t squared, I could say that ds dt is 100 t. Now notice that I'm taking the derivative of t, so I don't need a dt dt. That's that's just silly. Just kind of like when we were doing implicit, anytime we had an x, we did not write dx dx. We just left it because that was the variable. Um, so here we could say, based on what we know about s, that it's 50 t squared, um, that I could say that ds dt is 100 t. All right? Okay. The equation that relates them, all right, they already told us this, that tangent of theta equals s over 2,000. All right. Next is d, the derivative. Okay, so we take the derivative of that. Derivative of tangent is secant squared theta, and then we've got a d theta dt. I'm just going to rewrite this as 1 2,000th s in case that helps you. So this is equal to 1 2,000th, and then the derivative of s is just 1, and then we took the derivative of s, so we need a ds dt. Okay, so let's go fill in what we know. All right, so this is the s part. All right, we know ds dt is 100 t. All right, so I'm going to replace ds dt with 100 t. I'm trying to find d theta dt, so I don't have anything I can fill in here. Well, this is a problem. All right, so I get to secant theta. I don't have anything to fill in for theta, all right? So let's just pause for a second. Again, like in example four, we didn't have all the information that we needed given to us, so we had to go back and find it. So let's go back, and I'm going to draw this picture again right here. So this is fixed at 2,000. All right, so what I do know is that t is 10 seconds. I want us to find this information at 10 seconds. So one thing I could do is I could go back and I could replace t with 10. Um, and so this would turn into 1,000. Again, is, this is because t equals 10 right here. All right, so then let's go back to this diagram that we have right here. We know that the position is 50 times t squared. Well, t is 10. So then this side would be 50 times 100 for t squared. All right, so let me just draw that again. But now instead of that, I'm going to write 5,000. So this is 2,000, and this is 5,000. And so it's asking us to find theta at that point in time. All right, well, tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. All right, so tangent of theta is 5 halves. So we need to find the angle that we would get when uh, tangent is 5 halves. Actually, uh, we just need secant of theta. So let's think about this. Uh, we did problems like this before. You did this ones like this in trig, I know, where you were given an angle and asked to find a, a different unit or a different trig function. And what did you do then? Well, you went and you filled in the opposite side. So if we need to find secant of theta, then we need to know um, adjacent and hypotenuse in order to do that. So if we do this, um, this side right here, 
using Pythagorean theorem would be the square root of 2,000 squared plus 5,000 squared. Right. Again, maybe you wouldn't do it directly like that. Maybe you would just say, this. let's say this side is c. We would say c squared equals 2,000 squared plus 5,000 squared, and then you would take the square root to get that. Right? Okay, so if I'm trying to figure this out, let me do this. Um, I've got 2,000 squared plus 5,000 squared. Um, so 2,000 squared is going to give me 4 with 6 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 5,000 squared is going to give me 25,000 with 6 zeros. And this is going to give me the square root of 29 million. All right. Um, I have two sets of three zeros. And so this is going to be uh, 1,000 times the square root of 29. Let me just check my math on that. Actually, you know what? I didn't need to do all that work, but let's use it anyway. All right, so in order to find this, it's just going to be this unit of measurement uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. No, sorry, hypotenuse over adjacent. So, square root of 29 million over 2,000 and then squared. So I don't need to figure out what this is because I'm just going to square it. Sorry. Okay. So then uh, this gives us 29 million and then 2,000 squared is going to be 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and then d theta dt, I don't know what that is, equals, now I've got 2,000 uh, in the denominator and 1,000 in the numerator, this gives us one half. All right. Um, I'm going to stop and start again because I don't know how much time I have left before this cuts out. So hold on, I'll be right back. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure I have not made a mistake here. Okay, yep, I'm good so far. All right, so 1,000 over 2,000 gives me 1 half. Um, and then I'm going to try to solve for this. So I'm going to multiply. Actually, let me cancel all of these zeros. So I've got 29 over 4 d theta dt equals 1 half. And then I'm just going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal of this, so 4 29ths. These will cancel. So I end up with d theta dt. This is going to cancel with this, and I get 2 29ths. Right. And then I have to say what the unit of measure is. Now, this is an angle. Uh, it's clearly not measured in degrees because we're in calculus now. We don't measure anything in degrees anymore. Uh, well, most of the time, no. And so this would be radians. That's the unit of measure of an angle. So it's radians, and again, it tells us that it was measured in seconds. So this is radians per second. All right. I just want to go back here just really quick because I feel like I kind of rushed through this. So again, I know from up here that this is uh, 50 t squared. t was 10, and so that's why we got 50 times 100 gives us 5,000. This is fixed at 2,000, and if we use Pythagorean theorem, that's how we get the length of the hypotenuse. a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but if I just want c, I take the square root of that. All right. I combine them and I end up getting uh, 
29 million, square root of 29 million, all right? And the reason I need that hypotenuse is because it's asking me to find the secant. And in order to find secant, I need adjacent and hypotenuse. And before that, I only had adjacent. All right, so I found that hypotenuse, and now we would just say it's hypotenuse over adjacent squared. Again, I was trying to simplify that, but I'm going to square it right now anyway, so it doesn't matter uh, whether I simplify, because when I square it, that radical is going to go away. I get the 29 million, and then when I square 2,000, I get 4 million. All of these zeros drop out. All right, and that's how I end up with 29 fourths. And then again here, I filled in... Uh, 10 for t, that's how I got 1,000 over 2,000 is 1 half. So now I just get this nice, simple equation of 29 fourths d theta dt equals 1 half, and I just solve and get 29, uh, 2 29 radians per second. I would never in a million years expect you to be able to do this problem on your own as just our, uh, what, our fourth example that we're doing, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, this is our fourth example. Um, but it's really good as a refresher for, uh, for your trig, just remembering angle of elevation, the formulas here for uh, derivatives of trig functions, and remembering how to do this to, to find a missing side when we know two, so that we can find another trig value of this angle. Um, so all good refreshers, but again, this is really, I would say, a refresher and not something that I would expect you to do independently. So again, feel free to just stop, go back, look at it again, work through it step by step. Sometimes hearing it a second time, you'll pick up things that you did not pick up the first time. Okay, that is it. Bye.